Okay, let's continue with uh, chapter two, ancient Mesopotamia. <clears throat> we're gonna leave off, or we're gonna start off where we left off with figure 212 in the head of an Akkadian ruler. And if you refer back to the map um, at the very beginning of the chapter, I believe it's map two, one. Yes, map two, one. The Akkadian area is north of the Sumerian area. And what we've been discussing in the first video for this chapter was the Sumerian area in particular. Now we're talking about the Akkadians. And what I mentioned is that we have a series of patterns that are developing over the beard. And we saw this, um, and also within the hair, we saw this earlier whenever we looked at the statuettes that were in prayer and worship in the temple of Anana. And in that, our, um, in one of the temples earlier on and we had that pattern and that symmetry within the different locks and the different um, texture within the hair of the male and you can see it uh, making its way here presently within the casting process or the substitution process of the copper that is generating um, this head of the Akkadian ruler it's a material that's being used <clears throat> Another thing is um, you notice that the hair piece or the head piece that's wrapped around the hair is uh, two bullhorns that are uh, converging and touching together. Again, that's that attempt to synthesize the idea of the bull or the bovine as being the guiding force behind, uh, behind these Mesopotamian rulers, giving them a sense of divinity, giving them a sense of uh, purpose and, and placement uh, brought down by some form of divinity through their god and goddesses so their earthly divine rulers um, another thing that i want to mention is besides the tears and the eyes of course but the mouth the mouth is a very equal posed very relaxed non-emotional very rational smile now these were warriors they were definitely individuals that were looking to <clears throat> take over other city states and hence the Akkadian rule which ultimately took over the Sumerian area and even further east into the mountains <clears throat> but the rulers were seen with this uh, smile this very equal post smile and unaffected and very rational and logical we're going to see that that's actually going to be a precursor to a lot of the way a lot of the ways that the pharaohs were uh, depicted ideally um, in Egyptian art and that smile in particular is called an archaic smile archaic smile and it's supposed to represent this kind of rational contemplative nature where there's a lot of logic involved and not a lot of emotion so that smile is present there <clears throat> now with the eyes the reason that it is destroyed or it has been marred is because again tomb robbers they're looking at prying out precious precious gems that were most likely inlaid are put inside of this eye um, to give it again that sense of illumination coming from the eyes as if they are this they are this they, they are these divine rulers and these divine sources that the people are following but you can really see that there's a lot of realism that's starting to develop during this Akkadian and rule and it continues on in figure 213 with the victory stele of naram sin and you can see that even in the carving aspects you there's incredible development in detail and they even kind of obliterated or removed or omitted the idea of these registers that were very significant all the way back to the work of vase and how they moved into those coniform scripts that we saw during the Sumerian time. So the Akkadians have taken um, this coniform script technique and they've re, not refabricated it, but they've redesigned it. Um, and in figure 213, the victory stele, you can see that there's an emphasis on layering from foreground, middle ground to upper ground or background and background, um, which is something that's starting to show dimensionality as well as depth. Um, so they're taking this coniform script, but they're breaking down those hard horizontal lines and they're opening up the field of landscape, so to speak. Um, you can see in the very bottom, marching up towards the center of the stele, are the soldiers that are following behind Naram Sim. And like we mentioned before, with the hierarchical scale, Naram Sim is the is the largest figure in this script, in this uh, stele. And he's there in the center, and he's almost two-thirds the size of the mountain, which is what they're ascending. So his placement is very much that of a higher epsilon than everybody else. 
and you can see the opposition is being trampled over by the feet of the warriors and the infantry behind him but he's also been put in a place of mercy as well as force um, if you notice next to him adjacent within the uh, carvings of the mountains at the base there's one figure that has been struck down and another one that is in praise so it indicates that these Akkadian ruler that this ruler at this time Naran Sim can be very merciful and forgiving but also can be very fearsome and forceful um, so it shows both sides to these Akkadian rulers um, um, uh, Mesopotamian rulers uh, to kind of be more more general and again these are techniques that are going to transfer over into the Egyptians later on um, so again that hierarchical scale we see with Naram Sim being two-thirds the size of the mountain and then the stars that are up above the apex or the point the pinnacle of the mountain are going to be these guiding stars that are supposed to register divinity and you can see how close he is to this divine source he's really the only one that's close to that connection of divinity in the cosmos that is above that of the apex of the mountain so again indicating that kind of divine rule <clears throat> And then um, in figure 215, we can start to see the development of the ziggurat. And this is going to be a um, successor to that of the White Temple. You know, the White Temple, as you go back at the beginning of the PowerPoint, you can see that it's eroded down because they hadn't figured out how to utilize fire brick um, or mud, mud brick to be fired so that it has more permanence. And the ziggurat is an indicator of that technological development where they've used the fire to heat up the clay and now you have more permanence in the temple structure. They also learned how to use fire to heat up the metals for the casting substitution process that we saw with the copper that made the head of the Akkadian ruler. So the ziggurat becomes the fashionable temple archaeological technique after firing those mud bricks to create this more sense of permanence and there's a causeway in the middle where the rulers the the um, the kings as well as the queens and all the major priests that are involved in the worshiping of the temple that run down through the middle of that causeway and then everybody else of lower status um, will be there on the side adjacent to the ascendants of the of the high priestess which was the queen as well as the the uh, mesopotamian king on the way to the temple in the center that's called a causeway in the middle and that causeway we will see present in the egyptian times with the pyramids and what are called mastaba tombs as well <clears throat> Then figure 216 is a really, um, we're getting into a couple of really exciting sculptures because um, these are about an individual by the name of Gudea and we're starting to see sculptures not only about the Mesopotamian kings and rulers, but now about major patrons to the temples. So Gudea was a, was a very wealthy merchant and he had incredible wealth that was directly put into the temple construction of the uh, Mesopotamian temples and the ziggurats in particular. So he actually was so well loved by the higher elite that sculptures of him were developed and designed and placed within the temple structures and compounds as well, the temples in particular. Um, so figure 216 is Gudea seated and how we know that is writing and if you look at this sculpture you can see ac across the lower dress in which he's wearing are a whole bunch of symbols and those symbols are the form of Mesopotamian ancient writing that we have that has been um, transcribed and encoded through trans transcoded through um, Greek in particular and then into Latin and then all the way up into the languages that we the romantic languages that we know today so that written language upon the sculpture lets us know the history and the narrative about Gudea which is really exciting because this is information about an individual that is not a ruler but is definitely a patron to those ruling uh, kings and the temple activities that are um, being done at this time the, the construction techniques at this time and this is really interesting because in the Egyptian period there will be a chief architect who will be very similar to Gudea throughout the different pharaohs and the different dynasties that will oversee the construction of the palaces and temples and such uh, pyramids and all that and uh, Gudea is kind of like the chief architect if you will during this Mesopotamian time 
um another thing i want you to notice is the material that's being used the diorite we haven't talked about materials all that much and diorite is a very precious stone that's very hard to chisel and to carve so these uh, very important individuals the kings the queens as well as these patron these patrons to the temples and to the kingdoms were made out of precious material and not weak malleable material um, it's very hard very dense very compressed stone and then because of the nature of this good material uh, precious material it was placed within the temples as well right at the entrance of the temples so that you saw Gudea and you saw that this individual had a lot to do with the with the preciousness of that of that worshiping temple the work of vase all the way back at the beginning also was made out of a precious material um, which was uh, designated for um, I think it was the alabaster that was used for the development of the work of vase and again they would isolate and localize those precious stones for very specific um, worshiping elements within the temples it would not be stone that they would use in everyday activities or within ev an everyday home they were um, designated specifically for temples another thing with figure 216 good day is seated is the organic drapery again as i mentioned before you can see upon his left shoulder it's draping down there are the pleats and the cuts in the uh, fabric on his upper torso <clears throat> that indicate that they're trying to uh, what's called mimesis or develop a sense of realism um, with a body the natural anatomy of the body being underneath the clothing um, so they're developing that more and more and you can see it's very subtle, but it's present also in figure 217 with uh, Gudea standing. And you can see that um, his left shoulder is coming out of the fabric. And there's not a lot of uh, bicep, but there's definitely an emphasis on that left shoulder. Again, that terminology, that vocabulary <clears throat> is called organic drapery. And then also we have symbolism involved with figure 217. He has this pot, this earthenware pot, and it's overflowing with abundant water. And this overflowing of abundance is an indicator of his patronage and his fertility of patronage, meaning that he has all this wealth that he's making sure goes back to the temples and back to those, um, back to those worshiping um, play, or those places of worship. And again, we know this because if you look at his drapery at the very bottom of his clothing and what he's donning, um, there's more writing. And that writing, again, has been a trans not translated, but transcribed to be able to uh, tell us the story of Gudea and his importance during this time. And then the next figure I want you to look at is uh, figure 218, Steely with the Laws of Hammurabi. And what's really essential about this is the emphasis of writing and the writing of the laws and regulations during this Babylonian period. Um, majority, two thirds of it is a writing, mostly writing. Um, so all of this, uh, these symbols and such are, are um, supposed to be dissemin disseminating down from a divine source. So above, up top, is um, the laws and orders coming down from Habarabi and making sure that the writing and the element of leadership through the script of writing is now becoming a, a wing or an appendage to the ruling class. Um, so this is the first that we see where order and a system of governance is starting to take place in these laws of Hammurabi. And we're using or they were using um, material, basalt in particular, which is the rock that's found at the base of an ocean or the base of a sea um, that's been chiseled up and carved down to give this presence of order. Um, and then there's, there's, a, there's a conversation about who is who up on the top and um, if like who's Hammurabi or is Hammurabi, is Hammurabi seated on the throne or is he is he being told by a divine um, god, one of their many gods, on how to display this order down into the earthly realm? So, is and, and it's led to believe that you know if if it is Hammurabi enthroned, that he's very highly uh, he's a very high official in the eyes of the gods because he has multiple horns on the side of his head. But it's also believed that 
they haven't quite figured out the depth and understanding of uh, how to create dimensionality. So if you see with the figure that that is um, that is in front, if that is Hammurabi on the throne, um, his left arm is kind of twisted to the side to kind of show that he's getting ready to move these rules and laws back down to the earthly realm on behalf of the king. Um, and then all the multiple horns on the side, instead of showing another horn on the opposite side, um, they just went on, instead of showing one like over here and one here, they went on and just put them all in profile because they're still using that composite perspective. Okay, So they're, it, it, the leading belief, the leading evidence is that this is Hammurabi delegating law and they haven't quite figured out how to chisel depth in a way to show that there's both horns on both sides and they're still... Uh, defaulting back to that composite perspective or that twisted perspective where most of it's in profile but some of it's frontal which went all the way back to the Paleolithic time but you can see the figure that's standing they're making an attempt to show this motion this left arm moving to the side to accept the laws that need to be taken back down uh, but they but they still haven't quite figured it out <clears throat> And then in figure 219a, I'm showing you a restored view of a citadel. And these citadels are from the Hittites, uh, in particular present-day Turkey. And um, the Hittites were very much known for their military operations. So we'll find that a lot of the artwork that is uh, developed um, with the Hittites is very bellicose, and very warlike in nature. And these citadels are kind of the structures that focus on this fortification of defense. So they're very much interested in defense. And if you refer to figure 220, you can see the Lamassu man-headed winged bull is one of these guardians for this citadel. And it's one of these hybrid-like creatures. And you can see that the interest in the hybrid-like form is starting to develop more and more. And if you refer to the horns on the Lamassu, you can see what I'm talking about in regards to the, the law, the steely laws of Hammurabi. And you can see that there's those dual horns, two on both sides. And that's what leads us to believe that Hammurabi was um, uh, indi what, what is, is enthroned upon the last piece we just looked at um, because they hadn't figured out how to carve horns on both sides and find that, uh, that dimensionality. But here, whenever they carve out of the block of limestone, they can, uh, they can show the profile and the frontal and have it wrapped around, which is exactly what they're doing with the Lamassu. So again, starting to... Um, develop this sense of defense and guardianship and also the development of laws that we saw with the Hammurabi piece. But another thing, if you notice with the legs of the Lamassu, there are five. There are not four, there are five. Um, so they're, they're trying to also show movement and activity. And one of the legs moving forward in the center of the body uh, either was a mistake or it's supposed to indicate this forward moving movement of this uh, Lama Lamasu, which will attack and fly forward in defense or in offense if that citadel is attacked. So they're supposed to be very strong, very powerful, very aggressive. But at the same time, if you look at the human features on the face, which reflects that of these uh, Mesopotamian rulers, these Hittites out of Turkey in particular, there's that calm, kind of serene and rational and merciful look. So it's that uh, context of showing or content of showing mercy as well as force if need be. But these folks were definitely way more uh, aggressive than a lot of their uh, precursors leading up to this time. And there's even more indication of battle and war and taking over and conquesting. You can see figure 222, um, the Assyrian archers, and uh, the Assyrians are up there towards Turkey. So they're coming out of this Hittite, like militaristic um, uh, fashion of governance. And um, you can see that you have the archers up high that are shooting down at the individuals that are fleeing and they're pursuing those enemies. And there's definitely relief carving in regards to a lot of warfare and a lot of um, activity. Um, you, again, they're, they're still trying to figure out dimensionality. They've broken down the whole idea of the registers and now they're doing these whole landscape, almost flat-like forms. 
Um, and again, these are really coniform scripts, uh, figure 222 as well as figure 222A. You can see that they're carving into um, this gypsum, which is a form of calcium-based material. Um, some of us know it as plaster. Um, this is a fancy plaster, so to speak. But they're carving in and they're creating these low-relief sculptures, uh, creating these coniform scripts, which is something that dated all the way back to the Sumerians. But instead of focusing on communal activities of worshiping like they did with the Sumerians, they're using these coniform script techniques to show warfare and conquering and conquest. It almost looks like there's a tank there in the center of... Um, of the figure 222A, which is showing um, them conquering one of the enemy citadels, which might have been up north closer to the Turkey area. <clears throat> okay, well, I'll leave you at that. Um, go on and have a look into this, uh, into this latter part of the of chapter of the chapter two PowerPoint of ancient Mesopotamia. We're going to focus more on the ancient Mesopotamia, and um, that should get you through the first week of lecture information, and then we'll move on from there. We'll be moving into Egyptian art next. Take good care.